<laughs> the speaker lineup for this this soil regen summit is unreal. Take one or two pieces of information from each presentation and take it back home and incorporate those changes into your system. Be aware, Tom, you might learn something today or the next two days and, you know, that might change your life. But be careful. They are really, really uh, so nice that you actually might reconsider what you're doing in life and, and you might want to study protest. That's, uh, that's all I hope, actually. Thank you for a fantastic Soil Regen Summit 2022 in support of T. Yenny. Let's go. Your contribution really makes a difference. And here's why. The important part of the uh, TNE organization is, of course, the core team that are based in Malawi. They are all Malawians. Their job is to impart knowledge and skills to farmers. And um, I have to say, they do a brilliant job. And then have a look at the difference in the crops. Um, which farmer is going to look at that and say, oh, oh no, I, I like the small plants with the sort of yellowy leaves. Not a single farmer. It's so obvious. This one is under deep bed farming. And the, the owner of this one is the same as the owner of his food. And this is under rich farming. When a community adopts deep bed farming and they're not hungry anymore and they realize that they've in charge of their own futures one of the early things they want to do is they want to tell the world about it our theme this year is farming for the future and in alignment with this theme we saw many hopeful examples just like tny's lush green corn but as many of our speakers look to the future they first look to the past to honor and thank those who have come before to mentor and support them in their ideas in soil and farming. So here I honor many of the collective and personal heroes that were celebrated throughout the summer. Hello, I'm Jane Goodall. All the years I spent observing wild chimpanzees, our closest living relatives, made it so clear that we're not, as many once believed, the only sentient beings on the planet. The aid memoir for holistic plant grazing is by far the best system that I've ever come across. Hats off Ellen Savory for giving that to the world. One of my teachers was Dr. Elaine Ningo. Um, so much gratitude for her training in microscopy and uh, the concepts of fungal to bacterial ratio. It was um, vital for our farm and the decisions we were making. What a gift. Thank you, Dr. Lane. So many people uh, watching this uh, who have zoomed in and been attracted to Dr. Elaine Ingham's wonderful work over many years, as we have. Albert Howard, Lady Eve Balfour, Rudolf Steiner, Albrecht, um, boys, and, and I've put um, Alan Savory and Elaine Ingham as influential thinkers from the last century. You, you get to have uh me interspersed by others, bringing along concepts and ideas. I want to talk about kind of the grandfathers of the regenerative movement in uh, the Black community, but agriculture as a whole. B.T. Watley was kind of a protege of George Washington Carver, and they really pushed the idea of emphasizing how important it is to regenerate the soil and promote the use of compost for building the soil and replenishing those nutrients. The starting one is my, who I call my brother Rajendra Singh. Um, he's also called the Waterman of India. I had another great teacher who we call Master Cho. He's a Korean man that has taken generations of good science and traditional practices in both Japan and South Korea and honed it into a very elegant method. This is of course not a new idea. J.I. Rodale was writing about this explicitly, you know, back in the 1940s, as was Eve Balfour and Sir Albert Howard in England. Another visionary, wonderful, wonderful uh, man from Africa called, or the man of Africa called Zephaniah Firi. Anybody who met him said that the love that oozed from him, the love that he had for the land, the planet, the people, was uh, nobody ever forgot him or forgot that. My dad grew up on his grandparents' farm and my mom would come down and visit her grandparents' farm in the summer. My dad was a, a dairy farmer. I know how my grandfather 
used to um, sweat himself out um, uh, to be able to till the soil, plant his crop, grow them, and also harvest them. He didn't know how to farm in a manner that was better. Uh, all he did was to do his best using his hard work and uh, knowledge and information that he received through generational transfer. Agriculture was an, a part of my early life as a child. Uh, my great-grandfather, Joseph Carly Ivan, spent some time at the Carlisle Boarding School in Pennsylvania, where the motto was, kill the Indian, save the man. And there's uh, a lot of themes that um, of our lives as Native peoples that are impacted by certain eras in Native American history. Of course, when generational knowledge transfer includes the history of violence and separation from relationship with land, it's important to acknowledge those traumas, past and present, before we can move on to solutions together. So, let's go even further back into our roots. It is now thought that the very first Homo sapiens started in the north of Malawi, in the Rift Valley there, somewhere near Karonga, and started moving out of Africa. And I think that it's said that all of us are related to that one woman who left Malawi all those years ago. This part of the world has, for tens of millennia, um, perhaps longer, um, been part of the Jaja Wurrung Nation. Aboriginal people in this part of the world and across the 350 or so nations of this continent uh, have a very proud history and of course their um, health and nutrition and stature and lifestyles are very much linked in with the soil and health of those landscapes that they continually regenerated and we give thanks to them for all of the stewardship. Keep in mind that from an Indigenous perspective our land is who we are and access to land is critical. I also acknowledge their continuing connection to the land and waters and thank them for protecting this region and its ecosystems since time immemorial. When we think about the discussion of slavery in the US, slave labor in the US, oftentimes what's left off is that Africans that were sought after were sought after because they were very skilled laborers. They came from a very diverse climate, different landscapes, all these things that made their skill set very unique and very appealing to colonists. So it wasn't by chance that they were chosen. They were chosen because they had a skill set that was very unique and very beneficial to agriculture, agricultural practices. Acknowledging the history in its entirety within the agricultural space. Even if it's ugly, even if it's painful, we have to acknowledge it in order to move forward and develop some real solutions. We must have peace in order to restore degraded lands. But if we're in war, we're not going to be able to do that. So I hope we can all do our best to work for peace now. In order to start to ask what it means to regenerate soil, many of our speakers started by asking what happens when soil is degenerated. So here is what we face without soil regeneration. These two pictures in front of you tell you a lot about what is happening in Malawi, where it's going wrong. That chocolate brown topsoil being washed away from a hundred fields or a thousand fields. We, the global us, humanity, is losing about 0.3% of our agricultural capacity around the world each and every year to ongoing soil loss and soil degradation, soil erosion and the degradation of soil organic matter. What I really want to impress is that maybe you think of deserts and you think of them as being dusty, but a lot of these deserts, and especially the desert here in the Moab area, wasn't dusty in the past. Anytime there's dust, it's because these soils and these, um, these bio crusts and these vegetation communities have been disturbed. The dry gullies bear the scars of flash floods. These gullies are evidence of the enormous power of runoff during the rainy season. Without vegetation cover on the hillsides, when the rains come, the water doesn't soak into the ground but flows away in a flood. Then it's not available for agriculture during the rest of the year. This leads to drought, and famously for Ethiopia, famine. 
And these are novel storms, like I said, because historically these areas never had haboobs. So it's not, you know, it's not a word we're very familiar with because they have not been historically common. Um, but they can cause really huge consequences, which include losing that all of that topsoil. And as dust is carried in the spring winds, it kind of ends up landing on the snowpack and it actually can change the color of snow, making it darker. So what you see here is all of this dust, all of this red on the snow is dust from the Colorado Plateau. And the snow is actually able to melt faster because it's absorbing all of that energy because of its dark color. And it melts quickly and then we have a drought. So we have a flood as soon as it gets warm and then we are dry, 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 dry because there's no more snow in the mountain. The amount of erosion that that can incur can really add up. Why is we losing all this soil? More land is turned in a day than the hand plow could have done in a year. The microbes from within the soil are laid bare in the sunshine where they cannot survive. The soil quickly becomes dirt again. And now we get to the point where we define together what is regenerative agriculture. When we ask people what regenerative agriculture is, um, you get a whole lot of different answers depending on who you're speaking to. My definition of regenerative agriculture um, in a sentence is partnering with nature to grow food. To provide support for the black community in creative ways using agriculture. It would be nice to see some people who look like me in agriculture. Regenerative ag is all about the return of life to the soil. There's lots of ways to get that life back in your soil, but that is the central crux of what we're doing when we're doing regenerative ag. What do we really mean by regenerative? That first definition, eh, not so helpful, using the word itself to tell us what it means. I like that second one though, spiritual renewal or revival. I've definitely had moments like that out in the garden, on farms and in the kitchen. I love the third definition and why I like it so much, regeneration. This is a normal process. It's not a substitution and an add-on of some different product. That is not regenerative agriculture. It's not just, I'm going to do this one practice and I'm regenerative. It is looking at what works well in your local context. Of course, there's many ways of looking at this. And, and for me, I'm going to give you my experience because I'm a cattle farmer. Everything that, that we've talked about here so far is, is heading toward balance. It's a symbiotic relationship with Mother Nature. So long before agrochemicals, long before pharmaceuticals, what we had was our body wisdom, our microbiome, and the intelligence that is embedded in all of that. And so these regenerative practices, they are getting us back to what is really a normal process. It's how things ought to be working. Biological farming is natural farming without dependence on synthetic fertilizer and pesticides. Um, that's just how simple it is. We call it organic farming, carbon farming, regenerative farming. Look, it all based on the same concept, um, re revolves around biology and carbon. Our goal as farmers, farm managers, agronomists should be to help develop agronomic ecosystems that cycle large volumes of carbon. But the challenges of using the words like carbon sequestration and carbon loss is that it doesn't capture the ethos and the idea behind embracing that this is really a cycle and that it's up to us to manage this cycle really well. So if carbon is the driving engine, then the fuel for that engine is water. It's really important when we, if we are looking at the tree and shrub planting, do it with good preparation. So don't go and put an expensive tree into a cheap hole. And so this is a farming audience. And so I want to propose a whole new field of farming that you can get excited about and get into, which is farming biological soil crust to restore desert ecosystems. This is so important that we minimize disturbance. And what they meant by this when they, when they came up with these principles was to minimize chemical disturbance and to minimize uh, soil disturbance. So part of deep bed farming basket of technologies is to incorporate agroforestry. Here is a model 
that I've developed, and I call it regenerative hope, it's about moving beyond despair resulting from what appears to be a tipping point of life systems due to climate change. Valuing restoration higher than materialism and honoring the wisdom and stewardship of the indigenous cultures, who have always known that all life is sacred, is a much needed paradigm shift. For us at Integrity Soils, we define regenerative agriculture as a way of being in the world. When you listen to the voices inside the cultivars, like the history of quinoa, for example, um, native to South America, a sacred food for four different varieties, today considered a, 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 a power food, right? Um, but this is a very important native crop. It has its own history. It has its own legacy. It has its own identity. So once we go into a community, we try to understand what are the peculiar agricultural challenges that the farmers are facing. The life rhythms of natural cycles are ignored or overshadowed by the beat of an industrial march ever forward. We need to transition learning toward natural rhythms and a more functional human scale. Time is required for transition. I don't think this can happen overnight. We don't want to see anyone going backwards. So really just reduction is the first um, goal and then elimination of these um, additives. Can I offer you, the farmer, a better solution? Do not plough your field. Run a set of tines through and plant into the deep grass sward. Now this may take some getting used to and it may not necessarily be totally appropriate in all situations but it's certainly appropriate in most. Do not ever allow bare land to form as part of your farming enterprise in the first place. 100% ground cover, 100% of the time. Tillage has to stop. Think about it this way. If you can get those mycorrhizal fungi to develop and thrive, and then you come through with tillage, you're just wiping out those communities. So then those communities have to rebuild themselves just in time to have you come through again and wipe them out. So if all they're doing is rebuilding their communities, they're doing nothing toward building soil health. This is why I put stop tillage at number one. This is where it's at. This is what keeps our civilization together. This is the basic infrastructure that makes life on land even possible, is this thing that I call the soil sponge. And this is why I believe that the fastest way to regenerate soil health is to grow really healthy crops. We don't need to look at this at all in biological agriculture. If you have a good organic carbon, organic matter content in your soil, you're bringing up that pH. I visited farmers in uh, uh, equatorial Africa, Central America, all across North America. They were from very different environments with very different technological levels and growing very different kind of crops and different styles. What they had in common were they followed essentially practices that adhere to the three principles of conservation agriculture. Their combination of minimal disturbance, cover crops, and diverse rotations. Why was that the common element so successful? That's what all those little microbes are doing up on the screen around there for you. This is the recipe for essentially building and maintaining uh, soil life, a diverse community of life in the soil. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. As the concrete gets taken off, more of it as soil begins to get exposed, heavy work, and then the concrete gets taken away from the school grounds. And here you are, garden beds are created, and the children, this is the back of the school, and there they are so excited. So in a few months, there is the transformation of a parking lot into beautiful school gardens. To truly be regenerative, you have to take everything away. And I mean everything. Now I know that's a bold statement and that's probably too rigid of a statement, but let's compromise and let's fall somewhere on this curve and let's come up with a definition that gets us to regenerative farming. 
And then really acknowledging that the idea of regenerative agriculture is not a new concept to black or indigenous people. Um, black people have been doing this for generations and it is very important that they remain in this movement and um, not just as an afterthought, but as a significant contributor. Things like composting. So 5,000 BC, ancient Scots were known to put piles of manure, um, straw and compost that down. It's written about in Chinese and Hindu scriptures, the importance of composting in the Mesopotamian Valley around 2000 BC. Uh, so that's where modern Iraq is now. They were talking about how to make agricultural compost. And then when pilgrims first came to the Americas and met Native American or indigenous people, they were already using sheet composting. They were mounding fish and bio-priming their seeds when they were planting. This is not new technology. If you are not uncomfortable with what you are doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. Change is hard, folks. And everyone in this regenerative, sustainable, whatever you want to call it, this movement we're doing, none of us are putting down any current farming methods. That's not what this is about. There's a whole lot of practices that, that could be regenerative. So it might be diversity. It might be um, using biochar or silver culture or key line design or seed ball priming or integrating livestock. It might be using some of these biological inputs. Now we talk about a basket of technologies which with discussion and training and testing the farmers try out and then they select the bits that they want. You can have a prosperous life and, and, and one that you can transfer that, you know, you can leave a legacy that you would have worked hard for. So I don't know about you, but I hear many different concepts involved in what it means to farm regeneratively. We protect the soil surface, grow living roots, and incorporate multiple species while reducing or eliminating our agrochemical inputs. So this last facet, what can this look like? I could see really what I was doing to the environment in a way um, and financially costs were going up but our income was staying the same. I just said to myself there must be another way. I, I wasn't drinking my own milk. This is modern agriculture, not 10 minutes drive from my farm. High synthetic input, high water input, low return to the farmers. Millions of hectares or acres of land around the world, drowned in synthetic chemistry with reducing returns and increasing cost of production. The pathogenic fungal species are having ice cream every day. Synthetic in, we no longer use it. Matt, no longer use it. Potash, lime, chemistry. No longer use any of these products. And of course, if you have all the nutrients being given to your plant every second of every day, you don't need to be applying inorganic fertilizers. So this is one way we save money. If you're building a healthy soil, which will then create healthy plants. So this is only if you've got problems, you're starting to look into these things. And we want to feed all these nutrients, and here's some more here, um, with a good compost supply that's got these elements in abundance. Depending on your organic matter sources, um, you can generally, if you're paying attention, you can generally get adequate amounts of NPK out of those um, organic matter sources along with micronutrients. And the reason for that is this, if, if you're using mulches like I was, these were all dead plants. And so they contain the NPK and the micronutrients and it becomes a matter of cycling them through all of the soil organisms. So we're taking off our total dependence um, on synthetic fertilizers. This shows you for uh, examples for corn fields on average for the con their conventional and regenerative fields with revenue and, and, and total costs. You notice the conventional fields, the revenue is up here. Um, the costs are what you take off of that in the colors, you know, for that, as described by the legend on the right, you know, for fertilizer, for irrigation, for seeds, crop insurance, etc. What's left over at the bottom here is the profit. And you'll notice that the profit margin on the regenerative fields was much higher. Why? 
because they harvested more and they spent less to do it, leaving them with more of the income from the farm to stay on the farm. And when you add all of these up, that's $1.349 million. And, and that is an annual savings because we are no longer using any of these inputs. In order to get them to stop doing unsustainable agricultural practices, they have to have an alternative to that. They have to be able to eat, they have to make a living, and so they need an alternative. So this gave them the alternative. When you have a biological bazaar that is humming and thrumming with life, this becomes a health plan for crops. This is how you get off the agrochemicals that are designed to kill the pests and pathogens that are gnawing away at crops. The plant body, when we give it half a chance and when we feed the microbiome, it can defend itself just fine. But we have to pay attention to supporting that. And that's why I really consider the rhizosphere, the biological bazaar, everything that's happening there to be the health plan for our crops. Parasitic wasps lay their eggs in or on other insects, like you see here. And out of that egg comes a little parasitic larva that starts eating the insect. Not good for the caterpillar. A new wasp will emerge from this interaction. But it's good for the plant that this caterpillar is feeding on and it's good for the farmer that is trying to make sure that these plants are well protected. We discovered that plants are actively recruiting these parasitic wasps because they are emitting volatiles when they are attacked by caterpillars. All the grass is managed by Pablo here. And um, Pablo, three years natural farming now? Uh, three years, yeah. Well, going into four years now, yeah. The water that leaches into the waterways and, and uh, area around here um, isn't filled with a bunch of chemicals. No, none, zero. We are completely clean at that. There's golf courses all across California, all over the world that are in the most beautiful, pristine, ecological environments um, and they're using endless fungicides and to, to switch and to, to follow this, um, this natural farming methodology and, and your example. I did a synthetic fungicide for 22 years, so mm. I'm, you know, I've been in the other side too. I feel a lot better doing this than the other stuff because I know what the other stuff implies and what the other stuff can impact the environment. Mm. And that. In the natural system, outbreaks, if they happen, are checked quickly because in the diverse vegetation population in nature, access to susceptible plants is limited. In this environment, fungal species have the ability to act as pathogens, but not the opportunity. We have taken away all tillage all chemistry, all inputs of any kind, except for, for seed, of course. We also teach the smallholder farmers how to use organic pesticides, whether it is, um, uh, you know, making pesticides using um, uh, uh, neem products, uh, neem leaves, neem seeds, and also other, um, uh, you know, products from the tree, and uh, also using chili pepper. And below ground, uh, this insect is important. It's a beetle that feeds on the plants actually above ground. Of course, uh, it doesn't go into the root system, but it's larvae do. So the larvae are the big problem. I get asked all the time, how can you plant non-GMO corn without an insecticide? It's because we are close to balance. I'm not going to say we're at balance. I don't know if we ever will be, but we are a lot closer than we've ever been. So when you have the species that preys on corn rootworm prevalent enough in your system, they will keep the corn rootworm at bay. Nematodes are tiny little worms, and some of those nematodes are parasites of insects. So they actually get into an insect and they reproduce inside an insect. And I want to go back quickly still above ground to point out that we can use these soil organisms also to control pests above ground. And for that I have to introduce you to the fall armworm. Some of you probably are familiar with it. A tremendously important pest that has been a problem in the Americas for many years, as far as we know forever. 
and it has recently been introduced into Africa and Asia. Farmers who do have problems uh, with their maize, with uh, fall army worm or, or um, stem borer, it happens quite often, this deals with that and what's more, it doesn't cost them anything. They've got the plants growing on their land, they can treat their own, their masters and mistresses of their own destinies. They get infected, as you see here, within two days they die and again they become the source for the new generation of nematodes that you see crawling out of this caterpillar and that hopefully will then be nematodes that can kill also the next generation of the pest. In a good suppressive soil, the rhizosphere is loaded with diverse bacteria and fungi and other organisms or with a role to protect the plant root against potential and often only opportunistic pathogens. The point is, just alone, by, by eliminating that Roundup Pass, is the equivalent of what it costs to get this cereal rye crop out here. Think of the, all the nutrients we're bringing to the surface now to be recycled, regenerated, back through the profile, just by letting the rye go to maturity. We do not have pathogens in our vegetables because the sugar levels are too high. In natural farming, we, we look at fungal pathogens as kind of the low-hanging fruit as potential um, cost savings for a farmer. When I stopped using miticides, I did not have any spider mite. All the predatory insects came back into the vineyard and dealt with the spider mites. He planted host plants around the vineyard for the predatory mites during the winter leaf fall. He was one happy chappy because miticides are very expensive. Insects are not pests, especially when they are just serving as herbivores in this complex food web. And if we do not have pests, then we don't need pesticides. Great, we can all go home. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit more about how we can leave these asides aside. And I promise to do so using the soil food web. We have these glue guns in which we put a gel with the nematodes in there and squirt this gel inside the whirl of the maize plants as you see here. And we have done one trial already in Rwanda with that quite successfully, just one treatment. And, and it was just as effective in killing the, the fall armworm larvae as a pesticide treatment. Sommeliers often describe noble wine flavor with words like honey and ginger. This is because the noble wines have a higher level of a special aroma compound called phenylacetylaldehyde. Some of the mouthfeel comes from the glycerol content generated from the fungal infection. This organism cannot be bad, can it? Why would one then consider Botrytis scenario a pathogen? to be got rid of by synthetic fungicides. Look at the fungal kingdom as a friend. It's amazing like device and fascinating. If you spend some time to understand it and work with it. I've been working with the fungal kingdom 47 years, longer, and I'm still in awe. So who are these incredible creatures living in the soil who are helping us to do all of this work? Let's meet the microbes. What is soil, exactly? Do you have the mycorrhizal fungi? Protozoa, do you have both the uh, flagellates and the amoebae? Um, do you have the bacteria feeding nematodes, fungal feeding nematodes, predatory nematodes, the good guys, or do you have just root feeders? A teaspoon of good soil can have a kilometer of fungal hyphae. I did not do this alone. Sure, I filled up that barrow and I spread out all of those mulches, but these life forms here in the soil were doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Poet Wendell Berry reminds us that the soil is at once a living community of creatures and their habitat. In charts posted in classrooms, students learn that algae, ants, arthropods, bacteria, crickets, fungi, nematodes, millipedes, mites, moles, mushrooms, slugs, spiders, springtails, and ticks, among a myriad other organisms, interact with one another and with the plant biomass to form a soil food web. The upper left there, that is a clump of bacteria, one of your basic decomposers. 
upper right, what you have there is the big green noodle thing is a root hair. Swathing and coating that root hair are mycorrhizal fungi. That's what those spherical objects are, those round objects in the image. Those are spores of fungi. And that webby thread-like material is all of their hyphae. Soil protists come in various sizes and shapes and most likely you can guess from this that they play quite a, a number of different functional roles in soil. There on the left, that's a, a nematode and they vacuum up bacteria like nobody's business. So we had also the food web was starting here. And on the lower right there, that little guy is a microarthropod. So these were the kinds of organisms that were taking that first run at the organic matter and beginning to deconstruct it it was the action of the soil food web. What all the bacteria and the fungi and the mycorrhiza in the soil were doing with integrating that compost and recycling that organic matter into forms that plants could take up anew, um, and including the actions of microarthropods and nematodes and protozoa that would consume the bacteria and fungi and mycorrhiza that were consuming the compost, and what is their excrement rich in? Uh, the elements that it takes to grow new plants. So you must have the organisms in this soil in order for the, um, for the plants to even have a hope that they're going to get the nutrients that they require. In short, fungi eat death and in doing so create new life. Biocrests are really a community of organs, organisms that are living on just the top few centimeters of the soil surface. And they're made up of a multiple different species and organismal types. And so you have mosses here, you have lichens, you have cyanobacteria winding around all of this, you have fungi, green algae, and microarthropods like nematodes and springtails and other cool critters that we love to think about. And, it's really an incredible food web for those who are into food web ecology, which I'm sure some of you are out there. Part of the protists are protozoa, so these are the kind of the animal-like um, protists uh, that, that feed on uh, bacteria and other uh, small organisms. So we have four simple categories, the testate amoeba, the naked amoeba, the flagellates and the ciliates. You can see here in this picture, these are all these dangling things. These are filaments of cyanobacteria that are holding onto soil particles. And so the cyanobacteria has kind of shed a goo <laughs> off of the sheaths that are within the cyanobacterial body. And those kind of sticky goo and then the shape of the cyanobacteria really create a netting for soil particles to you know, hold on to and not you know, not get easily blown or washed away. And so here's even more zoomed in photo of these cyanobacterial filaments holding up you know, sand or soil grains. Um, and you can really see what it's doing, how it's winding its way around the particles. And really this is what is maintaining a lot of desert ecosystems so that they don't turn into something like the Sahara, which is just a mobile, mobile sand area that has nothing to hold it in place. If you pick up a, just a small amount of the, this material, um, you would pull up all this other material at the same time because all of this is connected together. It's one giant macro aggregate connected kind of like wind chimes. And this is done for free. Microbes don't send accounts. They work on pride of a job well done. But where are all of these organisms in the real soil? They're right here next to your root system. You go from only you know, six times 10 to the seven bacteria per gram of soil, uh, 1.35 micrograms of fungal biomass around that, that root or out here and away from the root. But when you get into the right next to the root, you have literally billions of bacteria per um, one centimeter area. You have masses of miles and miles of fungal hyphae in that root system growing along that root. 
the soil environment is is really complex and you have uh, mineral elements different sizes you've got pore space you've got roots you've got uh burrows of, of animals and so on horizons with different chemical and physical characteristics different microclimate different oxygen concentration and so on and one extremely useful adaptation is actually being an amoeba because an amoeba can can change its uh, shape and uh, can squeeze through tiny pore spaces and enter uh uh, from one uh, void to another and, and then capture uh, its prey such as uh, bacteria. So this is really a very uh, good adaptation for life in soil. I'm going to introduce my favorite tiny ally, which is arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, or I'll probably call them AM fungi throughout this talk. Uh, AM fungi are one of the most abundant and one of the most meaningful plant mutualistic partners in the world. We are going to harvest them and start keeping our own seed and making those heritable phenotype changes within our system. Because I am convinced that current varieties and hybrids have lost their association with the mycorrhizal fungi. Trees talk to each other as do the soil microbes. And between them, they transfer nutrients around the soil environment for the benefit of all. No waste. Elements are delivered as they're needed and never in excess. So there is no one single microbe doing all of this work. And a theme that I picked up on many of the speakers throughout their talks is that it all comes back down to biodiversity. Mother Nature protects all living things through diversity. Biodiversity is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more biodiverse you get, the more biodiverse you get. It improves itself. Who wouldn't want to have a positive impact on biodiversity? There is quite a, a broad range, a stunning range of uh, shapes and sizes among testate amoeba. Typically, when you think of diversity, it's only that multiple uh, species cocktails we need to think about annuals, perennials, and co-mingling cash crops. We're going to have peas and corn together. We're going to have peas and wheat together. There are all kinds of options we can do here. We have to continue to be creative. Desert ecosystems also hold immense biodiversity. They hold some of the world's most charismatic megafauna like giraffes and elephants, and they really hold a lot of charismatic flora like these pictured here, these Joshua trees or these saguaros or these beautiful junipers. Um, and these are plants that are very uniquely adapted to the extremes of these dry environments. Um, and these places and the, the living things in them have nourished people for hundreds of thousands of years. And really m some of the most biodiversity within cultivated systems exists within drylands. If we ask the question instead from why does the environment call the beaver? We get a totally different set of, of answers because the environment requires rehydration, because the environment wants to see a diversity of moose and um, you know, these are keystone animals, the beavers. When beavers arrive, that whole landscape comes back to life. So why is it that the environment calls the beaver? These are the these are paradigm questions. So starting to ask something from a different perspective, and it's something that I invite us all to do as we just go through life, really. Soils are basically a fingerprint of the evolution of Mother Earth. What this shows you is that Eukaryotes are really represent are really mostly protists. Only three of these groups are are not protists. So the plants, the fungi, and the animals. I think the beauty of complexity, which is the principle of all self-organized living systems, whether it be the soil or the plant or an ecosystem or a community, is that you find the truth by living it. Another picture of diversity, taking advantage of synergies. There's those peas growing in between those rows of wheat. This is awesome. We can maximize photosynthesis this way. 
bio crests really come in a variety of colors and a variety of forms and they're really kind of like the coral reefs of the desert and so here we have beautiful coral reefs you know with their colors and their different shapes and you know hopefully when you think of them you think of uh incredible places that hold a lot of biodiversity and a lot of importance and i really want to emphasize that the same is true for biological soil crests and i think this is the future here co-mingling cash crops look at this picture on the slide those are cold tolerant peas planted in the winter time uh, this was planted actually december the first into an existing wheat field many of the cover crops aren't just there to cover the soil but they actually produce a crop as well something like the lab lab bean or pigeon peas are very effective at that in malawi a standard vegetable is the leaves of pumpkin. Pumpkin leaves are delicious. They mix them with a little bit of ground nuts and that's your vegetable that goes. You get a bit of protein from the ground nut and you get nutrients from uh, pumpkin leaves. But pumpkin leaves, pumpkin is a great cover crop. Not the fruits, but the leaves because they spread and they'll go under, they don't need as much light and they'll go under the maize and under other crops. And just if any sunlight does get through the top crop, the cover crop, picks up the rest of it and protects the soil. Win, win, win. Instead of having just a monoculture of rice, hey, let's bring in the, the duck brigade. And of course, to support such vivid dynamic systems, we need to start with the foundation of water. Without water, we have nothing. Don't let the water run downhill. Catch it, hold it, let it permeate, let it percolate, let it slowly come out into the springs and the rivers and so on. Here's the pictures. These are pictures taken by us. This was February 2019, the water course, the, which was completely dry. And you'll see the time frame. The monsoons came and then you can see in September 2019 how the water was held. So it's almost like magic. In six to eight months, from no water, you have ample water and you have uh, farmers and you have communities that are now able to live a decent life. Just think about then anytime you have a nice heavy rainfall and that rain starts moving in, it's going to move downward, not across the top of your soil, downward into the soil. It replenishes the water in the pores that were built by the bacteria and fungi. When you apply water to the plants, the Zypid method helped to conserve the water so that it takes um, a longer period of time before the water in the peat is finished. Biocrest can also change the way that water flows over the landscape. So what you see here in this figure is kind of outlining the path that water would take if it had to go through biocrest. So you can see that it's kind of a sinuous path and you can imagine that that's going to slow the water way down compared to a flat surface. And so by slowing the rate at which water is moving, you're allowing a lot more water to absorb into the soil. Now what's cool is that um, if you follow the soil health principles, even a sandy soil will hold more water, it will slow down the water infiltration because the soil is more complex. We really need to look at our farming practices and build healthy landscapes by preserving life above and below ground. We saw what happened above and we saw what happened below. So if it's above and healthy water on the surface, you have to have a healthy soil down below, which has the ability to percolate the water, to retain the water and allow it to recharge the water table. Once you have worked hard to build aggregate stability and infiltration rates and all of these things that you've tried to do, you want to fill that profile up when it rains. It will hold that moisture for you when the dog days of summer come. And then we've got that moisture for your cash crop to live off of when those events occur. And you're not going to be able to do that unless you have the soil armored. What happens uh, when you change that structure is that what happens functionally when it rains is totally different. So the water is not running off. The water is soaking in. It's going down to the plant roots. It's not dry underneath. 
it's protected from evaporation. The answer is not to let the soil be exposed to the sky, to the elements, to the wind, to the sun, to the rain. It shouldn't be. It isn't in nature unless there's a catastrophic landslide or earthquake. The water layer, which is you know, fundamentally these days, most people looking at that from how does a raindrop interact with their landscape, but also, you know, the infrastructure of water, um, how we store it, how we pump it, how we reticulate it, how we save it, and how we're more efficient in its use. In just six years, Professor Lagessa Nagash and local villagers have transformed a severely eroded terrain by planting indigenous trees and plants. Almost miraculously, a clear flowing stream has emerged where once there was a muddy trickle. I also want to bring forward another theme I've heard in many presentations, and that is how we keep our fields rich in organic matter. So organic matter is basically like dead leaves, dead bugs. It's the what's left over from life, right? Um, and, um, and it's also the living. I like calling the rhizosphere a biological bazaar. Exudates are compounds and molecules that the plant releases out of its roots uh, into the soil, and it's feeding, all those exudates are feeding fungi and bacteria. And when it comes to root exudates, there are many, many different kinds, like carbohydrates or sugars, flavanols, that's just a type of phytochemical, fatty acids, we'll just call them fats, proteins. You're familiar with all of that. Well, guess what? These are the meals for microbes. This is what is happening down there in the biological bazaar. Plants are feeding microbes. One important exudate is glomelin. This is a glycoprotein produced on hyphae of our muscular mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and in roots. Dr. Sarah Wright, a scientist with USDA, discovered this glycoprotein in 1996. This glue attached to the mycorrhizal fungal biomass in the soil is thought to store one third of the world's carbon. All these different things and micro and macronutrients, nothing in traditional farming even looks at carbon. Carbon is such an important element and I believe it's been totally neglected in the past. Where does soil biology get carbon? Where does soil biology get all the carbohydrates and the proteins and all the compounds that it needs to sustain itself? You gotta have living roots as many days of the year as we possibly can. And, and winter to have these roots is amazing, you know? Yeah. I mean... Here I, in San Rafael. And you said just uh, reclaimed water is what you have access this to. This is this is reclaimed water, that's all it is. So I don't have... Uh, access to fresh water at all that's nice and white you know yeah that's how you want it yeah so, no brown uh, you just, and that's six um, inches eight inches down look at that we need soil that has the capacity to supply lots of carbon as carbon dioxide and this of course is where biology comes into play consuming root exudates but also consuming historical crop residue and releasing that as carbon dioxide Making compost is a simple process, but really takes a, a lot of effort to make it well. The microbial respiration activity is essential in the composting process. Well, you must have microbes or you don't have compost. A student was just so proud to display what they were doing at the school in terms of composting. Ruminants are cows, goats, and sheep. And they're really different than other herbivores. They have a marvelous part of their digestive tract called the rumen. And like the rhizosphere of a plant, it is the rumen that is the heart of the ruminant microbiome. This is where most of their microbiota are living. This barrel keg-like place that is really sort of a mobile compost. Heap. You'll notice a color difference between the soils. It's not because they're made from different geology or you know not from different bedrocks. It's the same underlying material. It's the same parent material. It's the same soil. What's different is they've been treated differently by people for the last century. Uh, and I've yet to meet a farmer who'd prefer to be farming this khaki, uh, salty, crusty soil than this rich uh, chocolate cake kind of earth. It's literally just across the fence row, um, and the difference 
is soil biology, soil organic matter. Um, one is more fertile than the other. What would that organic matter be for in the soil? Well, it's to feed the microorganisms. Just like you and me, they've got, to they've got to eat every single day. And of course, what gift do plants give us in return for such rich organic matter, rich soil, but food. And of course, food. This indeed was my happy place. Leaf thickness is a result of nutritional integrity, having generous levels of calcium and iron and other elements. Uh, leaf overall size uh, is again an expression of nutritional integrity, zinc levels, nitrogen levels, calcium, magnesium levels, and so forth. Uh, chlorophyll concentrations are a result of nitrogen and iron and magnesium. So it is nutritional integrity. You've never bought feed again. No, because where I, what I've witnessed is that I don't need it because I'm producing a more nutritious grass. And, I mean, and what does people that look, look like? At it, 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 it's not the look of it, Chris. The grass is amazing. It's the cow. You should see my cows when they leave the parlor. They go down to the grass. They eat the grass for 15 to 20 minutes and they all lie down. It's like a one big happy family. What, it, what did it used to look like when the cows went out to the pasture? They'd walk and then nibble, walk, nibble, walk, nibble. And then maybe two hours before milking, they'll all stand at the gate, roaring to get up to the parlor, you know, for more food. So basically it was telling me the grass isn't sufficient enough for them. Bear taught us how to dig up root vegetables and in, in not literally like sitting us down and teaching us, but from his behaviors. As, uh, as human beings, we're always looking for a food source. And when we saw a bear rummaging in the dirt, digging up roots and vegetables, we copied what he did and we learned that there were different edibles in the ground. This is a story um, really about two kinds of tomatoes. And it has to do with cultivars, like exactly what kind of plants are we choosing for our crops. Always listening to the cultivars, always listening to the foods. It has always been my most powerful teacher. The wines were definitely more vibrant. And that was proven with the trophies the winery won a couple of years later. Consider a really tasty tomato or an iced cup of coffee, glass of wine, beer, whatever your beverage or your food choices might be. When you chomp into them or you're slurping them down, it creates these volatiles in your mouth. And so these are just airborne molecules and compounds. And they go, they travel up uh, through sort of the cave-like terrain of your sinuses and your nasal cavity. They come up and they activate these olfactory neurons. And these olfactory neurons pass information directly off to brain neurons. It's going to help us make food choices that our tissues and our organs are communicating to the brain. Hey, more of this, less of that. Songs are about dirt, decomposition, and food. And these are very popular in many schools. We know one of the most popular ones is dirt made my lunch. And you take a look at these um, volatiles and their precursors. And in every single case, there are more of them in that wild type cultivar and it happens to coincide with tomatoes at peak ripeness. This is in part why we love ripe fruit. Dirt made my lunch. Thank you, dirt. Thanks a bunch for my salad, my sandwich, my milk and my munch. Cause dirt, you made my lunch. There was no squash anywhere in Europe before 1500. There was no chilies anywhere in Europe before 1500. There were no tomatoes anywhere in Italy, Europe, Spain, Portugal before 1500. There was no, no such thing as Swiss chocolate before 1500. All of these indigenous foods um, existed in the Americas before that. Thousands and thousands of years, they were used and cultivated by native peoples. And the, the process of colonization and the attempted conquest of the Americas seeds were taken and they were taken back to Europe. And on the same, uh, for, they called the Fertile Crescent from uh, the Mediterranean all the way across to Asia and Japan and you know, that part of the world, these foods thrive. These foods began to change world cuisine forever. We see the rise of mother sauces like the Espanol that involves tomato sauce. We see all the fiery cuisines of Asia 
uh, Cantonese um, cuisine, Szechuan, Thai, uh, Japanese, Korean foods begin to revolutionize. We see the, the change of the spicy curries with all the chilies. We see all of these culinary occurrences at, uh, because of indigenous science, because of indigenous cultivars. So many of our staple foods came from the Americas. Um, like think about where the Russians would be without vodka and the potato, where the Italians would be without the tomato um, to make pizzas. There are so many foods that we are absolutely reliant upon that came from the Americas. Corn only becomes what it is today because of human relationships. Corn only spreads from Mesoamerica into South America and up into North America because of migration, of going with people, traveling and adapting to climates, traveling and evolving and seed saving and selective planting, um, bioengineering, indigenous science, indigenous agriculture, ancestral knowledge that's connected to the cosmos, that is cosmological in nature, that's cultural and spiritual. So do you wonder what all this looks like down there in your gut? That's what this is all about. This is bacteria. They're rushing to the banquet table of fiber and phytochemicals down there in the colon. Um, purple, they're, they're just colorized to make it easier to see that turquoise and that purple. I could tell you, wait a minute, maybe I switched out the slide and maybe this is really the soil. Maybe this is bacteria running to the banquet table of mulch and the banquet table of exudates. Well, it actually is from the human gut, but you get the idea, right? There's a parallel there in the soil. They help us battle cancer, control blood sugar, modulate inflammation, keep our thinking sharp, keep the brain fog at bay, help our respiratory and circulatory system. There isn't one part of our body that you know, isn't affected by what our microbiome does. In other words, there seems to be some pretty solid evidence that the food grown on regenerative, under regenerative practices is actually better for human health. The hope that my children have medicine on the grocery store shelves, that it's all medicine, that it makes our bodies healthy. Now taken together, all of the systems for how we grow food depend upon our human structures and our human dynamics of interacting with one another in community. So here are a few clips focused on our community structure and what I noticed about the social aspect of regenerative agriculture. And taking action, it cannot be one person alone. It has to be achieved in participation through with the community. Community-driven decentralized water management, everyone doing their bit. So in the example I showed you, it was the community coming together and doing their bit. They weren't expecting us to do it. If they had expected us to do it, then it's our project. But with them doing it, it's their project. We can't do this alone. The system also builds in social capital because as they work in groups, then they help each other more and they become aware of the needs of uh, the other farmers. Um, this also allows them to gradually get out of um, the project site because after three years, it means that farmers are able to train each other through the decentralized demonstration garden. And that gives us opportunity to move to another community. I had seen some challenges within the Black community growing up in Memphis and really wanted to see, man, I think agriculture can help support some of these challenges. We've worked on literally tens of thousands of projects, um, mostly looking at people's uh, infrastructure design, but also looking at their management frameworks um, and so on um, to help people generally in startup and transitional phases, having a platform, uh, it to, to be able to organize and categorize all of that is really important. The Farmer Institute platform is um, a crowdfunding model that uh, leverages on uh, professionals, everyday professionals like doctors, lawyers, engineers, people who understand the problem of food security, people who understand the environmental challenges, uh, who want to farm, but either they don't have the knowledge to become farmers themselves or simply they do not have the time to become farmers because of um, their conventional uh, work. At the end of the farming uh, season, 
the profit that is made is shared between the smallholder farmer and the farm sponsor and also the safe farm. And manage your economy like a perennial species, not like an annual because you are a perennial species. You're here for a while, so please do that. But over the years, I was able to co collect all of this amazing information around how do we actually support young people to thrive in this sector. BC Watley saw that farmers market can sometimes place more strain on the farmer than support at times. So he really saw a great opportunity in pushing the pick your own model and really getting consumers to come to the farm itself and pick the items themselves and making the farm engaging, kind of what we're seeing with agritourism and all of those things today, really seeing how we can get people to come to the farm and support the farm. The men reach out for the pickaxes and the women don't. And both men and women say, well, pickaxes is man's work. And um, our field officers say, oh, why is that? Could you explain? We'd, you know, I'd be interested to hear that. Well, you can imagine after 10 or 15 minutes of discussion, the pickaxes are distributed amongst the men and women because, of course, there is no reason why a woman can't use a pickaxe just as well as a man. The community is how you how you learn and figure out what's working for people. And, and the natural farming community is pretty cool and helpful. They're, they've been great. For me, collaborations and partnerships uh, with a shared value is something that we can uh, work towards where you find um, organizations that live in, in, in these remote places that already know the communities and working with the communities. You know, big business that's coming from elsewhere, whether they're donors, whether they're providing capacity building or whether they're providing products. It's so critical that we're able to find uh, these uh, points of collaboration um, to be able to make sure that we're building a conducive ecosystem that enables those participating in the sector to keep thriving and in the right way. We can take the, the, what we witnessed during Black Lives Matter, during land back movements, during the conflicts that we're seeing around the world right now, and plan and lay a foundation for ethical relationship building. Because remember, everywhere you are in the United States, South America, Mexico, United States, Canada, and Alaska, you're on indigenous land. You're on native land. So building ethical relationships and partnerships with people is important. If they are to maintain this and sustain this water that they were going to bring back to their land and their region, then the only way forward was participation with them. And that was the key also to unlock local action. It shouldn't be that we are doing the work. We want them to do the work because when you do the work in participation, when they do the work for themselves, then they own it. Because we understand that unless the smallholder farmers are able to own the process, uh, we will not be able to achieve sustainability. The same is true for anyone that works in farming, nutrition, anything to do with food and land management, because here's how I believe it works. So much of the foodways are behavioral. Everything is about doing and behaving and hard work, the discipline, the long hours, um, being in the fields, digging in the dirt, being in the sun, being in a hot kitchen, right? All these different environments where we are, they're very behavioral. And guess what? You know, all a big majority of health and healing modalities are behavioral. I think about the hungry and the homeless and how I can be of service to them. So social justices are explored by the students, going to the food bank with the food they've grown. Uh, this happens a lot in several places. And then you have here is a student who is feeding the homeless at a homeless shelter. So that link is really important. Who is privileged and who is not, right? Ecological restoration is not theoretical. It is physical. And the actions of millions and billions of people are needed to reverse human impact on the climate, making ecological restoration also the way to ensure full employment, food security, physical and psychological health. 
are we ensuring that these Department of Agriculture are engaged with city planning? Are the, um, are the farmers being engaged in a way that is appropriate where maybe they're being presented opportunities the same way grocery stores are and have helping solve this problem? So really just have to be creative in how we approach the challenges that are being faced um, by the Black community by utilizing agriculture in a way to do so. The students were just letting be, relaxing, and accepting the grace of land and the mystery of the sun. You know, they had worked for a while, they had worked the soil, and then took a moment to just breathe and take that moment into their bodies. We are changing paradigms so that kids are part of the soil food web. To bring us home, let's circle back to our theme. Farming for the future. This is easy, sorry. Oh, no. Hi, Izzy. Welcome. As I went through these experiences where I, I was sitting and finding myself sitting in boardrooms um, with ministers uh, and very important people, I then realized that there's this one you know, this one voice that I keep hearing, and I wasn't happy about this voice. And, and this voice said to us that young people are not interested in agriculture. And I just, I just battled to understand that because in my experience, I worked with many young people in the sector. And we, I believe that it was through the fact that they were not supported well enough that they are not visible currently right now. What do you notice about the kids? They are so intent, focused, and seem to have a sense of purpose. A group of first graders could not wait to check the compost when their teacher said, let's see if the compost is ready. They took turns to lift the soil out of the compost pile, even as they paused to examine the number of live creatures they found, roly-poly, earthworm, and so on. The joy of soil being alive was evident in their squeals. Children are fascinated by the organisms they discover in the soil. In restoring the Earth's natural ecological function, we all have a role to play. If we all play together, it's going to be both effective and a whole lot more fun. How will this process be supported well into the future? Uh, because to be regenerative means that there's going to be other generations involved and a lot of the time people are starting this um, not when they're in their 20s but in, when they're in their 50s so you know you've got to look at the next generation immediately um, it's very important just imagine the great possibility it would be and what agriculture would really look like um, if young people were supported really well. We brought livestock to their high school. We paired them with African-American mentors in agriculture. We not only wanted to help them develop professionally, but we wanted to help them develop personally as well. If I gave you a stories of each of these young people, you realize that a lot of similarities in terms of characteristics is that they are high energy, enthusiastic and ambitious. You know, that's definitely something you will find in many of our young people in the sector. They are creative, innovative, and they are breaking boundaries just to get them to the power of nature, I suppose, you know, what's there in, on, in, in our front yard that we can use for the rest of it, really, you know. Fund them, uh, resource them, volunteer with them, join them, but don't sit at home thinking, I, what is it I can do? I can do. There's plenty you can do. I too, just like, you know, the big farmers, would love to uh, transfer the work that we're doing to the next generation. We are going to turn this around too. We're going to get soil back up on its proverbial feet. We're going to get our crops and our animals healthy again. And that, in turn, can ripple right on through to us. The future of agriculture, I think, definitely, it needs to head in the direction of soil health for all of these reasons. Topsoil formation should be the number one outcome of human habitation. Um, if that was, uh, if that was, uh, the, if that was the key policy of everyone from President Biden to President Putin to President Johnson to every other leader in this world, if we could say to them, can we get you to agree on just these as being the core 
functions of everyone. One is that management should all should be holistic, and two, as an outcome of that, that topsoil formation should be our number one outcome. If we did those two things, then all of our lives would be so much better. So both we need a healthy soil. We can use soil organisms also above ground to make this work, and we need plants that do the right thing, signaling, producing odors that help these wasps and these nematodes to find their pests. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? You see green down there instead of black or brown. This is what I mean by regenerative farming. This is the epitome of it right here. What ought our ruminants to be eating? They really do best, and we do best, when they are eating the fat of the land. And what do I mean by that? I mean a diversity of living plants. And the reason for that is this. Chloroplasts, these are the part of a plant that allows it to photosynthesize. And these chloroplasts are able to capture sunlight in part because they are made of a variety of different kinds of fats. And fats can be very, very quick acting, really responsive kinds of molecules. Something perfect for turning sunlight into energy. Photosynthesis is the only way we have of bringing new energy into an ecosystem. The energy from the sun is powerful and folks, it is free. The need to be, you know, prophylactically doing stuff to feel like you're contributing to the health of your plants and of your soil, you know, you can kind of back off when you've made that transition. So that's what gives me faith that it will ultimately be more sustainable on a large scale. This is the result of good management versus really, really poor management. It's no longer dirt, it's now soil. What happened to their actual crop yields? Um, well, their corn yield, uh, their traditional corn yield of a ton and a half increased to about four and a half tons when they adopted these conservation agriculture methods. What happened to their, their other key crop, cowpea yields? They doubled. I know I get excited on this, but man, when you do things like this, you are smiling from ear to ear. I'm proud to be a farmer, but I am way more proud of the way I farm. I call it regenerative organic stewardship with no tillage. I think the three principles for me that I've learned from nature, number one, diversity. Nature does not live through uniformity. Nature is not a monoculture. That's why we have the richness of diversity in the world. Number two, nature does not work with linear extractive systems. Nature is always giving the, you know, all the time law of return. The seed becomes seed. The organic matter becomes soil and then becomes organic matter as a plant. Um, and the third is resilience. When we talk about the challenges that the black community faces, it is not pleasant and it's not something that brings joy. But one thing I will say that brings me joy is the resiliency that I see within this community of agriculture. And of course, we then will be able to have um, happy farmers who are able to you know, live a, a better, more productive life in an environment that is more secure and is sustainable. One of my favorite things about cooking is how the food, learning how the food behaves. And again, this applies to all trades, all crafts, all professions, right? Not only how the objects behave, but also how we behave in response to them. So when you're out in the landscape, how does your body respond to stress, to climate, to change? to new techniques, to even relationships you might be building with people. Um, it's important to pay attention to those. What did I do? I got my wheelbarrow out. I painted it with flames because I had to do stuff quickly. The question becomes, can we address these problems at the scale with which they are occurring? And I, I really believe this. I really believe that the answer is yes. And, and that's because of because of people like you, because everyone coming to the summit, because working towards regenerating the foundation of life, which is our soils, that's the way we're going to be safeguarding um, the incredible resources and, and truly safeguarding this planet. And so beyond farming and being directly involved in soil regeneration, there are lots of other things too that you can do that are related to caretaking for these landscapes that speak to your passions and your skills and you know the impact that you want to make on the world. 
to allow for these quiet moments, magic emerges. To restore the land, we must re-establish our connection with the land. We must remember we're part of the natural world and depend on it for food, water, clean air, shelter, everything. And we must restore our spiritual connection with Mother Nature. We must work together, each in our own way, to create a better world, to live in peace and harmony with each other and with all life on Earth. Our planet is in crisis, so let's make use of the window of time that we have. Let's get together to restore that which we've destroyed. For the health of the planet, for our own peace of mind and for future generations. I really truly hope that you'll join me and all the others who are choosing to take the flourishing path.